on World News Tonight. High stakes showdown. The United States and Russia face off on the conflict in Ukraine. Russia denying escalation while the US continues to rally support against possible invasions. Tonight, the details on the UN talks. Trudeau positive. Canada's Prime Minister tests positive for the coronavirus as the rest of the country opposes the government's recent jab mandate. While the conflict escalates, so does the caseload in the divided nation. Olympic Omicron. Athletes participating in the Beijing Games come down with the virus, the caseload continuing to increase within the bubble. However, some hope is left with the situation slowly coming under control. And celebrating spring. China kicks off its seasonal gala extravaganza with spectacular displays of themes vibrant with colour and charm. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Tonight's coverage is still leading with the Ukraine border dilemma. There were some sharp exchanges in the United Nations between the U.S. and Russia diplomacy going where, nowhere as the showdown grows over the Russian military buildup on its border with Ukraine. As Ukraine appears to show more signs of preparation for war, civilians are getting weapons, training, and the U.S. took its growing concerns over Russia's plans to the U.N. Security Council and the U.S. warning the Russian buildup threat threatens Europe while Russia is accusing the U.S. of whipping up hysteria while denying plans to roll troops across the border. The U.S. and Britain also said they are prepared to punish Russian elites close to President Vladimir Putin with asset freezes and travel bans if Russia enters Ukraine. Tensions between Russia and the U.S. over Moscow's troop buildup near Ukraine spilled into the United Nations Security Council on Monday, with both countries accusing each other of provocation. Russia's UN ambassador Vasily Nebenzia said there was no proof Moscow was planning military action against Ukraine and blamed the West for hyping the threat of war. They themselves are whipping up tensions and rhetoric and are provoking escalation. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield countered that it's the threat of Russian aggression that's at issue, not America's desire to deter a military conflict. Our encouraging diplomacy is not provocative. What, what exactly do you think you accomplished at this uh, Security Council meeting? And at the State Department, spokesman Ned Price was challenged by a reporter about whether the Security Council merely provided another forum for discussion without any action. The point today, Matt, to come to your question, uh, was um, to continue to shine a spotlight uh, on what we are seeing. Did the Security Council actually do anything? If, if the criticism is that we are engaging too robustly in diplomacy, that we're being too transparent, that we're being too consistent in what we're saying, I, that is criticism that, that we will accept if okay. that's a criticism you want to lodge. Meanwhile, the U.S. and Britain said they are prepared to punish Russian elites close to President Vladimir Putin with asset freezes and travel bans if Russia enters Ukraine. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov called the British warning very disturbing and said it made Britain less attractive to investors and would hurt British companies. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is due to travel to Ukraine on Tuesday, where he said he will urge Moscow to step back from the brink. Also on Tuesday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is expected to speak by phone with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. We now move on to the COVID updates around the globe. Kids in Australia equipped with masks and tests pack their bags to return to school for in-class learning once again. Despite the rising cases, the population in Victoria have taken all precautionary measures to try and revisit a normal school life. A swab, a mask, air purifiers and a bag packed with books. It's back to school, 2022 style. I'm kind of nervous. Very excited. Hopefully everything can be pretty normal. Happy! Well, good, it's my first day. Those special moments were captured at the school gate. Smile! 
But for many, getting ready started well before they got there. Rapid tests now strongly recommended for all Victorian students. Two tests per week so that we can go to school without um, infecting others. A negative result at home is the ticket into the classroom. But paediatrician Sarah McNabb didn't get those single lines. Her family's Sunday night tests all positive. Parents at Mountview Primary picked up their supplies this morning. Five free rats per student for weeks one and two with more to come in week three. My son would be not liking that but then um, we have to explain them this is the good thing. The extra protocols aren't enough reassurance for others. Katie Kennedy's daughter Alana has diabetes so she's made the call to keep her kids away from any risk. 44% of children aged between between 5 and 11 have now had their first dose, including Shane Huntington's youngest son. But the father of two is worried about ventilation and keeping him home until he's double vaxxed. Staff having to call in sick is tipped to be the system's biggest challenge, but teachers say they're ready to get back to the old school routine. Following the mass trucker protests in Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has revealed he has tested positive for COVID-19 along with his children as he calls out the group against the jabs for compromising the country's vaccination drive. This virus affects us all. Two of my own children have now contracted it and this morning I learned I, I tested positive for COVID-19 as well. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced Monday he was positive for COVID-19, but feeling fine. I feel well and have no symptoms. Trudeau, who has championed the vaccine and got inoculated in front of cameras last year, went into isolation last week after one of his children tested positive and said he would continue to work remotely from an undisclosed location. Trudeau's positive test comes as dozens of trucks and other vehicles have jammed up central Ottawa since Friday and thousands descended upon Parliament Hill to complain about Canada's COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Police said most demonstrators have been peaceful, but local residents complain they are fed up with the non-stop blaring of truck horns. Some also forced a homeless shelter to give them food, the shelter said on Twitter, while others flew Nazi flags. Trudeau on Monday said Canadians were disgusted. I want to be very clear. We are not intimidated by those who hurl insults and abuse at small business workers and steal food from the homeless. We won't give in to those who fly racist flags. We won't cave to those who engage in vandalism or dishonour the memory of our veterans. Senior members of the official opposition Conservative Party, which last year lost its third consecutive election to Trudeau's Liberals, have praised the demonstrators. But Ottawa's mayor, Jim Watson, condemned what he called the more extreme behavior, saying, quote, My message to the truckers is you've had your protests. You've had your rally. Time to go back home. The Winter Olympics may be on the verge of being compromised as the committee has reported a rising number of infections from within the athlete pool. In a bid to contain the spread, a closed-loop bubble system has been implemented. During the past four days, China has detected some 119 cases of COVID-19 among athletes and personnel linked to the Beijing Winter Olympics. Authorities are imposing a closed-loop bubble to keep participants, staff and media separated from the public. Some 3,000 athletes, along with coaches, officials, referees, federation delegates and media are expected for the Games due to run from February 4th to the 20th. Some tested positive before even arriving in China, like the world's leading women's ski jumper, Maritza Kramer of Austria, who tested positive in Germany at her last competition ahead of the Games, rescheduling her departure in an effort to get healthy in time for her competition. But Games organizers said most are testing positive after arrival at the airport. Russian biathlete Valeria Vasnetsova said her own Olympic ambitions were over after testing positive twice following her arrival in Beijing. She accounts for one of three Russian positive tests announced on Monday. 
In contrast to many countries seeking to live with COVID-19, China has isolated itself with a zero-tolerance policy, cancelling nearly all international flights. Olympic athletes and others must fly directly into the city on charter flights and are tested daily. The closed loop will allow them to move between accommodation and Olympic venues on official transport, but they are not allowed to move freely in public. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologised yet again after his government was criticised for failures of leadership and judgement in allowing lockdown breaching parties at his offices. And I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. Yet another apology from British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Monday. His response to a newly released report into COVID-19 lockdown parties allegedly held at his Downing Street residence. The investigation by senior civil servant Sue Gray highlighted serious failures of leadership and judgment at the heart of government and condemned some of the behaviour by authority figures as being, quote, difficult to justify. Johnson said his government would learn from these criticisms. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. And I want to say... And I want to say... To the people of this country, I know what the issue is. Yes, Mr Speaker, yes, yes. It's whether this government can be trusted to deliver. And I say, Mr Speaker, yes, we can be trusted. Yes, we can be trusted to deliver. The inquiry said that some events at number 10 during the pandemic should not have taken place. But so as not to prejudice an ongoing police probe into the parties that could take months, Gray said she could not offer a meaningful report, and only an abridged version of her text has been released. The commander overseeing the police investigation, Catherine Roper, says authorities plan to contact people with questions about the parties. Johnson has so far survived calls from opponents and some in his own party to resign by saying people needed to wait for Gray's report. For now, he must hope that his Conservative colleagues do not trigger a confidence vote against him in a bid to thrust him from office. It is not clear what will happen if the police report shows evidence that Downing Street parties did in fact break the law. Still on the updates on the UK Prime Minister, Boris Johnson has vowed that a plan to overhaul EU laws copied over after Brexit will encourage businesses to invest in the United Kingdom. Let's cross over to Abdel the World News Special Correspondent Dilini Sararatna from London in the UK for more. Dilini? Yes, Anuradi. The Prime Minister said a Brexit Freedoms Bill will make it easier to change thousands of EU era regulations that remain in force. He said that it would allow the UK to set growth-friendly rules for cutting-edge technologies of the future. But the plan has been criticised by the devolved administrations. Since Brexit, the UK has moved away from EU laws in certain areas, including on immigration, payments to farmers and gene editing rules for crops. But the Prime Minister has been under increasing pressure in recent months from MPs on the rights of his party to go further. In an announcement for the two-year anniversary of the UK's exit from the EU, Number 10 said its new bill would ensure changes can be made more easily. PM Johnson said it would allow the UK to shape better regulations in areas where it is strong, citing areas such as cyber technology, artificial intelligence and gene editing. Downing Street said the changes would build on the others since Brexit. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Dilani Senevaratna, reporting from London in the UK. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Myanmar's junta marked one year in power today. Despite fresh foreigner sanctions as demonstrators promised to rally against the army and its bloody crackdown, 
The major takeover ending the Southeast Asian country's brief democratic interlude has triggered mass protests and a crackdown on dissent with more than 1,500 civilians killed. The junta is struggling to contain the backlash unleashed by the coup, with daily clashes and swords of the country remaining outside of its control. Junta chief Minong Lane repeated the military's claim it had been forced to take power following fraud in 2020 elections won by Aung San Suu Kyi's party that international observers have said were largely free and fair. He said it would hold free and fair polls by August 2023 if stability in the country is restored. The streets of commercial hub Yangon were busy as residents ran errands and met friends ahead of a silent strike protest. Ahead of the anniversary, the junta has threatened to seize businesses that shutter their doors and warned that noisy rallies or sharing anti-military propaganda could lead to treason or terrorism charges. Mali gave the French ambassador 72 hours to leave the country after describing comments by the French foreign minister about its transitional government as hostile and outrageous in a statement read on Mali's national television. The announcement was made on national television and signaled the latest escalation in tensions between France and Mali. The French ambassador in Bamako, His Excellency Joel Mayer, has been summoned by the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. During this exchange, he was told about the decision taken by the government to ask him to leave the country within 72 hours. Bamako said the decision to expel France's ambassador was in response to, quote, hostile and insulting comments made by the French foreign affairs minister. Jean-Yves Le Drian last week condemned the forced withdrawal of Danish troops, part of a joint European mission to fight jihadism in the region. It's a new sign of recklessness. This junta is illegitimate and it's taking irresponsible measures. His words in turn prompted a strong response from his Malian counterpart. Insults aren't proof of greatness. We are willing to discuss with France or others on serious matters. This isn't about being irresponsible. What we are trying to do is defend the interests of our country. Relations between Mali and former colonial power France have soured since the army staged a second military coup in May last year. Another source of tensions is the presence of Russia's Wagner Group in Mali. Paris had previously said any deployment of Wagner mercenaries would be incompatible with its own mission. Three weeks ago, after the junta said it would postpone elections, West Africa's economic bloc ECOWAS slapped Mali with tough sanctions, including border closures and a trade embargo. The move sparked mass protests in the Sahel country. Many in the streets held anti-France and anti-ECOWAS signs. There is growing fallout in Washington as former U.S. President Donald Trump, including the suggestion that he might pardon people convicted of crimes related to the January 6th attack if he is re-elected. Tonight, the top Republican on the January 6th committee warning former President Trump's embrace of his supporters convicted of crimes related to the attack sends a dangerous message. The congresswoman responding to these comments made by the former president Friday night. If I run and if I win, we will treat those people from January 6th fairly. We will treat them fairly. And if it requires pardons, we will give them pardons. Now one of Trump's top Capitol Hill allies pushing back, too. I don't want to reinforce that defiling the Capitol was OK. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything that would make this more likely in the future. As he mulls making another run for the White House, the former president also arguing against a bipartisan effort to update the Electoral Count Act, suggesting Sunday night that with the law as written, Vice President Pence, quote, could have overturned the election. That statement adding pressure to clarify the law soon. Almost certainly we'll have a bipartisan bill there, fix what happened, the insurrection stopped that from ever happening again. A bill the January 6th committee sees as potentially helpful, but not sufficient to counter the former president. Republicans accuse President Joe Biden of politicizing the Supreme Court, with one calling his promise to nominate a black woman offensive and another saying it is a case of affirmative action. 
Tonight, as President Biden narrows down his pick for a Supreme Court nominee, some Republicans are taking aim at his pledge to appoint the first black woman to the bench. The fact that he's willing to make a promise at the outset that it must be a black woman, I gotta say that's offensive. It's actually an insult to black women. Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi comparing the president's pledge to affirmative action. But neither of those senators objected when former President Donald Trump announced he would pick a woman to succeed Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It will be a woman, a very talented, very brilliant woman. Who well, I haven't chosen yet, but we have numerous women on the list. When Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1980, he too campaigned on a promise to make history, in his case, by nominating the country's first female justice. One of the first Supreme Court vacancies in my administration will be filled by the most qualified woman I can possibly find. It's time for a woman to sit among our highest jurists. Of the 115 Supreme Court justices in American history, 108 have been white men. Only five have been female. A black woman has never even been nominated. He will choose uh, and nominate uh, someone who has impeccable credentials and is eminently qualified. There's no question in his mind that there is a wealth of qualified, talented uh, black women to choose from. And a key Democratic senator says it's about time. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Vaccination against COVID-19 slowly gained pace in Nigeria after the government destroyed more than a million expired doses last month and assured citizens that it will no longer accept vaccines close to expiry. Police in southwestern Germany were conducting a cross-state manhunt after two officers in their 20s were shot and killed at a traffic stop overnight on a remote country road. Marking one of the biggest moves in the mid-season transfer window, the Arsenal striker Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has been signed by Barcelona FC on a free transfer following his exit from the Gunners. Chicago Blues drummer and vocalist Sam Lay, who performed with the likes of Bob Dylan, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, has died at the age of 86. Lay died of natural causes in a nursing facility near his home. Sony said it will acquire Bungie, the original creator of the Halo video game and developer of Destiny, in a deal valued at $3.6 billion, making it the latest in a wave of consolidation sweeping the gaming sector. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at China's annual Spring Festival Gala, celebrated with a variety of spectacular events. Thank you for joining us and good night.